Hello, I'm Fred Joy, your host for the Smarter Software Outsourcing Podcast. Today, I'm pumped to show you this chat I had with Rene Koshi when he invited me as a guest to his podcast, Predictable B2B Success. We discussed the competitive landscape of software development outsourcing and how Arcanis differentiates itself by placing emphasis on company culture and community. The key points we touched on were, first, the evolution of Arcanis from a necessity-driven pivot to a premier software development outsourcing company. Second, the significance of differentiation and cultivating long-term client relationship in a saturated market. And lastly, how strategic investments in startup are shaping the future growth of Arcanis. This episode is packed with insights on navigating the software outsourcing industry, fostering innovation, and positively impacting the tech community. Check out the full conversation here, and thanks for tuning in. If you look up the challenges that face most B2B businesses around creating predictable revenue growth, a lot of the st statistics seem to lean towards issues about lead generation and content marketing. But beyond that, I wonder if integrating strategic investments and a purpose-driven culture into your business model can actually accelerate predictable revenue growth and foster long-term innovation. Our guest is well placed to answer some of these questions and we'll share some insights into this. But first, hello, welcome to the Predictable B2B Success Podcast brought to you by SproutWorth.com. I'm Renee Koshi and our guest today is Frederick Joy. Uh, Fred, you're not just an entrepreneur, perhaps more of a strategist with quite a background working in Switzerland's insurance, finance and software space. You've actually had more than 20 years of experience in that space. You've more recently navigated the software development, outsourcing, remote and distributed teams, team augmentation as well, developing a rare understanding of client needs. Now, the company that you're co-founded and president of Arcanis was founded, I believe, in 2010. And then in 2016, you established another company that provides niche software for the advertising industry. Now, that's quite a journey. I'd love to dive into it, but I'm curious, why go into, why develop Arcanis? Because uh, at the present time, I seem to be bombarded with emails from various insuring and outsourcing companies from with everything from virtual assistants to software yeah. developers, etc. So I'm assuming it's a very competitive space. Why develop uh, Arcanis? Yeah, um, so thanks for having me, Bine. It's a pleasure. I think Arcanis happened a bit by chance or simply because we needed to pivot our previous business. We arrived in the Philippines with my business partner, Alan, in at the end of 2009. We had an e-commerce business that we were running from Hong Kong that was related to online games, mm -hmm. bought a small business in the Philippines and realized that what we were doing in Hong Kong, we could do it a lot better and a lot cheaper in the Philippines. And so we started setting up our customer service team at the time. We had, the, because of this e-commerce venture, we needed to have customer service 24-7. And then we also built a small team of developers for our own needs, transferred from a team we had in India, but we wanted to have everyone under the same roof. But the game publishers had another idea with the business because the economy system around the game with their their business model, which really didn't go very well with ours. The revenue was dwindling. We were losing money and the business ended up not making any sense at all anymore. And at some point I was like, I came two years before for an entrepreneurial journey from Switzerland to Asia. I had not much money. And well, my business partner had sold his business for a significant amount of money. I wasn't that lucky. And so at some point I was like, dude, we have to pivot. We have to do something else because we can't just keep on losing money. And we had, so while we were setting up our own team, we had friends who had businesses who were asking us to help them out with software developers as well. And that was a small opportunity that we didn't really look into so much at first, but we had to at some point pivot. And so we're like, okay, so... How about we we shift and start offering software development outsourcing to other uh, businesses? And it happened at the time, so that was 2010, that where I think the barriers to entry were pretty low because you could just hire a bunch of devs, take your phone and call a bunch of businesses in Switzerland, Australia, wherever. 
And if your price was low enough, people would give you a chance. And so that's really what happened with Arcanis. But as you mentioned, we always were in a very competitive space. And sales methods have changed a lot over the last 15 years to a point where if you don't have a solid network of people around you, the email game doesn't work anymore. Google ads is you have to pay to be on top and it's hard to get qualified leads. So it's been a constant for the last 15 years, being the head of growth for Arcanis has been the hardest and least rewarding things I've ever done in my life. It's been, if you ask me, would you go through this again? I would say, no, I wouldn't. But I think we were lucky enough to be early in the game, to try to be a lot more high quality than the other ones shooting random emails that we steadily grow still with that without having a predictable business uh, business and income stream it would mm-hmm. never was predictable so we can talk about this because that's a, a eternal challenge we were able to be at a place where i think business started coming to our to us not as fast as we would have liked but on a on a steady fashion that helped us sustain the business hmm. just to be clear our Kenneth's office outsourced uh, software developers, primarily from the Philippines, is that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, I'm assuming that in your uh, previous roles back in Switzerland, uh, you had some exposure to outsourcing that kind of led to this initial venture with gaming and then Canis as we know it today. Yeah. So, yes, uh, both in the industry, in the insurance industry where I started my career and then the banking industry. And then after that, before leaving for Hong Kong, I worked for a fintech. The word didn't really exist back then, but it was a fintech. I was always exposed to outsourcing in various fashions. So uh, participating in, in outsourcing projects as a member or negotiating contracts, because at some point I was a corporate buyer. From different aspects, I was always interested and in, in involved in outsourcing. So when we we had this gaming e-commerce business that didn't fare so well anymore. It was natural with the experience of my business partner who had set up development teams and myself having been close to outsourcing for so long, it was an easy thing to to do for us to jump in and start building teams. I had no sales experience though, but you're going to learn and improve every day. So that's, yeah, that's what uh, we did. Certainly. Uh, And given your journey to date, what would you say is your personal area of strength? I think it's the interpersonal relationships with people. I've always loved being around people and trying to help Mm -hmm. because that's what I like to do. And I think that's what never killed my enthusiasm throughout the challenges that we had to grow, to talk to people, to go with them and try to find solutions and finally gain their trust to, to grow their business with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in that area of strength, uh, what would you say is something that businesses don't know, but should? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Luke, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what to, to tell okay. you here. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Not a problem. In our earlier conversation, you we, we were talking about strategic investments. Yep. Now, uh, at some point, I believe you had an insight that led our chemist to pivot towards strategic investments in startups. Yeah. Uh, could you describe that moment or, or that event that occurred and how it's taken you to this new direction? Yeah, so it was a series of events. The first one is when you're doing software development outsourcing, you're selling hours, right? And if you, it's not scalable in, in a way where you could have a bigger multiples and you never really own IP. And the idea that we had with Alan was always to, we wanted to build a technology company. And while we are a little bit of that, but not really, mm-hmm. we were like, but we can, we are the engine for these companies. So why don't we invest in a series of, of companies through what we know how to do, which is extending their development teams, uh, helping them improve the efficiency of their teams, filling in the blanks in their teams if you want. Uh, So why don't we do this instead? And so we started first with our existing customers. And at some point they were raising funds so they would let us know or we would tell Mm -hmm. them, hey, next time you're raising funds, if you're interested, let us know. And that's how we would 
that's how we would invest. So we had one or two businesses we invested in that, and then we're trying to find okay, what's the model for us to keep on 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 scaling that? But of course, it requires a lot of cash flow. We were smaller back then, so we had limited ability to invest. But over the years, we've grown and we've increased our cash flow, and and so it's a bit of a like a virtuous circle where you invest in a startup is doing well, and then suddenly they can hire more people from you and they're okay to pay for their team because they love mm-hmm. working with the guys. And so it's we're creating... So the goal was not to create clients, but the offset of that is that it actually is creating new customers through us investing first and then helping mm-hmm. them scale faster. That's very interesting. What, what sort of criteria do you look for in startups when considering them for investment and how do you assess their potential for synergistic growth with Arcanus? So the few criteria we look at is where they're at in their journey. So we're looking at late seed, pre-series A kind of companies. So meaning that they have some traction, they have some revenue, they have built a product, they don't need to make major pivots anymore. The second is that they're raising money at a valuation between usually two and ten million dollars, it could be a bit higher for hardware companies that we also help sometimes that are raising around half a million to two million dollars and that have at least a coding CTO or lead developer, if not a small team of developers that they want to extend. So they need to want to raise money to actually extend their tech capabilities, right? Because that's the that's how we invest. After that, we're looking at the team. We, when we look at the financials, we want a team that has known how to manage effectively their money so far, meaning that they're, they're not going to burn and die too quickly. And after that, it's really, yeah, looking at the journey so far and see, see, yeah, see what they want to build in, whether we can help or not. So we need to be able to make a significant difference in their journey, if you want, by, by us coming in. Clarify my understanding. <clears throat> Do you actually work with them for a while before you entertain the idea of investment or do you do due diligence outside of a working relationship in order to determine right. whether they are investment ready? So it could be both. At the beginning, we started investing in our existing clients simply because mm-hmm. that's what happened. But now we're actively part of angel investor networks, talking to VCs and getting some new potential investment from that. For example, we've invested in three Techstars companies because we have a partnership with Techstars. And so they provide us with companies that need help and while they're raising funds. And that's when we jump in along with Techstars, for example. Certainly. I know you alluded uh, a little bit to this, but I wonder if you could elaborate uh, in what ways have your strategic investments in startups influenced your relationships with existing and potential clients? Uh, could you repeat the question? I'm not sure I, I I'm sure. sure. <clears throat> in, in what ways have your strategic investments in startups influenced your relationships both with existing clients as well as potential future clients? I think it's the understanding that when we commit to a client or an investment, we're a hundred percent behind them. So we're extremely careful in who we work with. Even if they want to come as a client, we onboard few customers because we want to make sure it's a perfect fit. And that if we say yes to working with them, we're going to succeed together. So if we see red flags in values, in how the team is set up or managed, and if the technologies are not the ones we think should be used, so we don't change them, we onboard with them, with the right technologies for them to to move forward, we just turn them down. So we turn down 90% of the paying customers that want to work with us simply because it's not a fit. And it's doing service to us, obviously, but also to our clients and not embarking on something that wouldn't match uh, their expectations. And the last third item is we are very careful about the types of project we take on because we want our developers to learn and grow over time in that project. So we need to make sure they're going to be challenged, nurtured, and that they're going to enjoy working on that for many years to come because that's 
the timeline that we have is a long time. It's not like we're just in for a couple of years and then we just uh, mm -hmm. leave. To get that recipes formula, pretty difficult. I would think so. I, I would also imagine it would lead to some very interesting conversations around setting expectations. Uh, so I'm curious, how do you navigate um, these conversations? Uh, because I would assume from the little experience that I've had that sometimes clients would come in with an idea of what they believe is for them. Perhaps it's asking for senior developers yeah. Yeah, only. Yeah. How do you manage expectations and get them to come around to your way of thinking as to what's best for them? Yeah, so we basically look at the facts and the experience that we have, right? So to, to explain our rationale. And sometimes we agree, sometimes we don't. But we have one policy... Um, that's very close to my heart is to be extremely honest. And sometimes it could be perceived as a bit blunt, but it serves the purpose of being able to set the expectations, as you said, from the get-go. So we're very factual, very blunt, and explain the rational of, of why we think it should be that way instead of that way. And usually when you explain, people listen and, and try to understand and come to the same or a different conclusion, but at least... There's no, there's no hard feelings because it's really explained in both ways. And then we come to an agreement that we can work together or we can't. And it happens that sometimes if it doesn't work the first time because the client is, yeah, that's not going to work for us or whatever. Uh, but it's rooted, our position is rooted in also all these years of experience. They come back to us and they try with someone else and they're like, yeah, didn't work. We like these guys because they were honest and transparent, although they might have offended me a little bit. But I know they're always going to be honest and truthful with us. So that's how a few of the investments we got and also clients we got are back or working with us on the second attempt. And we've kept mm. them. Certainly. Brilliant. Uh, with with the competitive nature of uh, software outsourcing, um, you're up against uh, competitors like uh, TopTal, for example. Yep. Uh, how do you differentiate yourself from uh, many of these players? Mm. Well, in the case of TopTal, they have a little bit of a different uh, business model because they get really the top experts for smaller projects or mm -hmm. ad hoc stuff when there's a little gap in their team. But you're right, there's so many other competitors. And I think our strength lies in a few things. The first one is we work mostly with Western clients from Europe and, and Australia. And having Western owners that are on the ground, taking care of the teams, and making the bridge between different cultures is an extremely important element in the trust that you can have from, from customers. So that's the first thing. The second one is... We're a bit of a boutique firm because we don't want to grow at all costs. We're very careful, in, as I mentioned earlier, of the quality of the clients or the investments we onboard, as well as the quality we deliver. So you can't scale this easily. And so I think that's what people, at least when they talk to us, like from the website, it's pretty difficult to just uh, get that feeling. But uh, I think when they talk to us, they realize how much care we, we put in the relationships we build both with our employees and our clients and the trust that we can have from that as a result. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> would I be right in saying that making sure there is alignment between the client culture and oh, yeah. that of uh, the Arcanist Arcan company culture, or at least the team, needs to occur in order for you to be able to deliver the project success? Successful. To onboard a new client, uh, everyone goes through me at first. It's the first right. call happens with me and the potential client. And that's where we establish a lot of the culture discussions, like on how they manage people, what they see for themselves, and uh, all these things that are extremely important to us. And that's where at the end of the discussion is, okay, what is my gut feeling telling me based on the thousands and thousands of conversations I've had? the clients we work with and their feedback. And so if the human element um, is good, uh, then we can proceed on to the more technical and business discussions. But if the human element, if you want, the culture is not there, then we just 
we just decline uh, to work mm-hmm. with people because that's what makes things work or not. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, so uh, it's interesting that you uh, say that you rely on your gut instinct. Experience plays a role in this, but are there specific things that you're looking for in, in the conversations that you have? Yeah, it's. I ask a lot of questions about how they envision the collaboration with their uh, Filipino team members, and so I listen to how they how they value things, how they envision the collaboration going, the, the communication in the how is the team structure going to work, what are the, their expectations in terms, for example, of working hours. Is it like a, a crazy hustle culture, or is it a well organized company that? doesn't burn their people, for example, small things that actually pile up through the hour long or uh, 90 minutes conversation. And at the end, because it, then you end the call and I look at my notes and everything and I'm like, so how do I feel about this? And maybe sometimes it's just the next day. I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. mm, or yes, really good. And that usually comes earlier. But if there's some, and I used to never trust my gut so much until a, a couple of years ago where my business partner is like, sometimes he's like, oh, I don't feel it. I'm like, where do you feel this? Like how? And then he explains to me how he thought about things. And I was like, oh, maybe I should listen to myself a little bit more. And actually it's a brilliant indicator. And the gut mm-hmm. feeling comes, as you mentioned, also from all the experience you've got and all this assimilation of the different uh, situations you've been in, what's worked, what's not worked, and at the end of the day is uh, helps you make a decision, a much better decision, actually. Uh, do you find that there's much of an education process required, even though you feel that there's a good fit, perhaps on the part of the client or even your own team, in order to ensure things like communication, yeah. etc., yeah. are a bit of a match? Yeah, I think uh, throughout the throughout the the collaboration there is continuous education on both ends. So mm-hmm. at first we do, when we our developers join us, for example, we do uh, cultural trainings, for example. So we educate them on, okay, you're going to interact with Western customers. This is the way they think versus the way that your culture in general thinks. So looking at the gaps, looking at where things match and then bring awareness also to our clients to how do you deal with Filipinos, for example, in that instance. And, and then... As projects keep on going, sometimes we discover, okay, the way the client is conveying his expectations to the team, for example, could be a bit of an issue. So then we go and educate the client and saying, okay, we understand what you want and stuff like that, but maybe look at this and that. Sometimes we ask the client to shift roles also, or we add people in between the developers and, for example, business people, because business people are usually pressuring other people to get stuff done quicker than the music, but you can't stress a developer because then mistakes come in, shortcuts are made and the product quality suffers. And so mm. it just, it's a bit of a, of an orchestra. I have to make sure that everything's right to deliver a good outcome. It takes time. Right. Brilliant. Uh, could you uh, expand on that by sharing an example of how Candice's approach to long-term partnerships has led to significant growth or success for a client. Yeah, so uh, one thing people are looking for is stability in their teams, right? And so when you want to build a business, you have to have rock solid foundations. And I think what we're trying to provide to our clients is this rock solid foundation, knowing that we are with them no matter what, I shouldn't say no matter what because uh, there's conditions, but, <laughs> but we have their back. If we're in with them, then we will advise them on how to build a solid team and making sure that we also internally are always able to respond quickly to their growth needs. And for example, we would refuse new clients if we foresee a big growth, uh, internal growth, because we want to serve our existing customers first. And then if we have enough people or enough capacity to onboard new customers, then we will do that, for example. The other part is working a lot on the company culture because if you want a stable team, you have to make sure that people are staying with you. That's why we pick our clients carefully, but also why we work so much on the company culture, making sure that 
we, we try to do everything we can for our developers and other employees to just come to work and they know they have to work, obviously, but it's a bit hassle-free for the rest. We try to cover for healthcare for them, their family, give them workout memberships. We built a gym for them. We, we, we offer them, for the ones that have been with us for five years or more, it's a one overseas trip per year with their wife or their parents or their kids wow. together with all the others so they can mingle. So it's, we really try to, okay, there's work, but there's also things that you can enjoy on the side with us. Okay, brilliant. Um, you mentioned that uh, it's been a bit of a struggle for you in terms of ensuring this predictable revenue growth. What do you find to be your biggest challenge? It's the, I guess it's the reputation of the outsourcing industry. If any outreach is doomed to fail, if, it's, if it doesn't, if it's not absolutely outstanding. So over the last 15 years, we've tried everything I could think of. Every year was different. Every year we had to invent something new that no one was doing. And if I get a cold email... How would I want it to be for myself? And then I would never send anything that I think would be uh, disrespectful of someone's time when they open an email. We would try also some social media ads that were different and probably not boring because selling outsourcing, it's pretty, it's pretty boring if you want. It's not a fun business, right? It's serious business. And because the competition is so high, everybody gets hammered just like you with these crappy emails that just annoy you and, and make you hate outsourcing, really. That's how it is, right? And so for us was to be able to land somewhere on someone's screen at the moment they need someone, which would make them think, okay, I need outsourcing. And I've seen something from Arcanis that is a lot better than all the crap that I've seen before, meaning I may want to talk to these guys instead of someone else. So that's, that's been one. And I think the other part that is hopefully creating some really steady growth is our investments. Because the investment is, of course, a huge investment of hundred dollars to $500,000 in, in acquiring a new client, if you want. Because at the end of the day, we can't keep on giving them money forever because a, a, a business needs to make money and these startups we mm -hmm. hope they're going to survive and make some money some will die some will succeed and so for us it's a bet with them and we become shareholder and we will always have their back but we also expect them that at some point they will be able to sustain the team they have with us hence creating a new customer if things work because it doesn't always work so it's a bet we make together and if they can pay us it means they're in a good position to to move forward so in, in the last uh, year what would you say has been key drivers for growth uh, at the arc of uh, the key drivers has been in internal growth so growth from our existing clients so that's been good the economic climate has been challenging for developers for the last two years yeah. there's been a lot of layoffs we've been lucky that we kept on growing and most of our clients have retained their people and we've got a few people coming through referrals and online presence and all that stuff but one of the main drivers for this year has been investments we've made in the past that are really starting to pay off with some investments growing pretty well. Some We also lost two, two companies in our portfolio that had to wind down, but but the others have more than compensated for that. And so it pays to bet on good teams that then succeed. I'm curious, there would be some who would argue that focusing too much on company culture could detract from the overall goal of maximizing ROI. How would you respond to that? I think it's true. So for our philosophy is we're not maxing the ROI. Like it's, we're not in there to make the most money uh, we can and become filthy rich and, and just leave crumbs to the rest. The, I think what we're trying to do is I want to be proud of what we're doing and change lives, mine, but also other people's lives. And that could be our investment, that could be our clients, and that has to be our developers as well. It just makes it easier for us to hire people because we have a good reputation. 
yes, we pay above market rates. Yes, we give more benefits. And maybe we don't maximize the profit. But I think the company itself is a lot stronger as a result. And mm-hmm. maybe if you count like 50 years down the road, I don't know, maybe then we would maximize ROI. Maybe, but maybe not. Mm-hmm. And that was very clear from the start with Alan that we wanted to do the right thing first. And then if the money follows, then great. But we, I don't know if I should say this, but we're not looking at the numbers very often. We know, are we making a profit? Yeah. Yes. Can we reinvest it in startups? Yeah, Absolutely. Are we looking at the, is it a 1,000, 2,000 at the end of the month? It doesn't matter. Or 10,000 or 100,000, it doesn't matter. It's what can we do with what we've produced. Certainly. Yeah. Would I be right in saying that your culture could be described as being purpose-driven? Yes and, and no. It's micro-purpose-driven in the sense where we are trying to do the right thing, but mm-hmm. the purpose in the teams, if you want, our employees comes from the teams they're working with. So they know that we have their interests at, at heart. We have a foundation where we help uh, with early education, about a thousand families a year. But our purpose really is to create a really good working environment and do good. But when we look at the companies we work with, whether it's an investment mm-hmm. or not, is what is their purpose and how can the developers relate to the purpose of the company? Should they Are they going to be proud of working with that company or not? whether it's the mission of the company or is it the people they're working with. And so that's like what we're focusing on, if you want. And to Alan and I as business partners is like, how can we grow other businesses through what what we have? We see what we have as an engine to help others because it is an engine. It is the engine of the software development team. Uh, 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 That's an interesting point. So... How would you assess this? Uh, Or perhaps I can ask this a little bit differently. What factors influence your decision to take on a project from scratch versus augmenting an existing infrastructure? It's it's the values of the founders or the people running the business. And whether it's from scratch or not, it's just a different way of doing things if you want, because we Mm -hmm. might have to be more involved like with the higher technical architectural stuff at the beginning. But at the end of the day, it's like, what do these people want to do? How do they want to do it? And can we help? That's the three questions we ask ourselves in any case, whether it's augmenting or starting from scratch. Uh, So uh, are there uh, metrics or indicators that you use to measure the success of your strategic partnerships, uh, as well as investments in startups? Yeah, uh, so would they... the metrics are pretty simple. Um, the first one is, is our client happy? So we send surveys to our clients mm-hmm. to evaluate the performance of the developers. We talk to our clients regularly as well to understand if they're happy. We have a net promoter score that we measure. That's, uh, I think it's 81 or something, so it's pretty high. Don't quote me on the 81 because I don't (laughs) remember, but I know it's good. And the other side, we also survey our developers and ask them if they like their projects, if they're happy to work in the company. We are every year we have the great place to work survey that's done by a third party Mm -hmm. that, you know, and we've won one of the awards of the best IT company to work for in the Philippines. We're not number one, but we're in the top, in the top of these companies. So to us, those are the things that we, that we measure. And the last thing at the end of the year is, did we make some money that we can reinvest in startups or just to know if next year we'll be here? But what we look at is really the satisfaction of, the, of what we're providing to our employees and, and our clients. That's what matters. Certainly. I also wonder if you can share a learning experience or a pivotal moment from one of your investment ventures that has shaped uh, our Kansas approach to business? Uh, so one of our investments, it's a fintech in Australia. So they've worked with us as a customer first. And at some point they were raising money. So we decided to do a small investment with them. And uh, during COVID, they had a bit of challenging times because they had a pretty sizable team with us. But when transactions reduced dramatically we had two ways of going was like either we reduce the team with them and we let them try to survive or 
we take a vote that uh, we ask them, okay, what are your opportunities, guys? If we double down and double the team size, which is what happened at the end, but and this happened in several discussions, not just one day we like double down, but what can, how can it go for you? And I think for me, I've, I've always been pretty a bully uh, on, on, on the prospects of the startups. I, I'm a super positive person. I, I may be a bit too enthusiastic sometimes, but I like to challenge like, hey, what can we do? What more can we do with helping you? Because if the guys are not working for you and we're doing an investment together, they're going to sit on our bench. And then for us, it's revenue that is lost or we help another business perform better or take bold bets when everyone's sleeping because the world has stopped, what can we do? What can we do to put you forward? And that company is the proudest investment that we have for now because it's performing incredibly well. It's an amazing team and we've built amazing friendships with these guys because like, we wouldn't be where we are without them and the opposite is true the, the other side is true as well. So I think we, we've we created such a positive outcome for all of us so far that I always think now, okay, I take bets on people I like and believe they, they've shown they can deliver. And so if people deliver in what they do, then you gotta, you got to help them as much as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, yeah. I'm looking to wrap up here. And I wonder if... There's a couple of areas that you, in software outsourcing and strategic investments, that you find doesn't get much airtime or doesn't get talked about very much. If so, what would they be? I think it's the is human element, like people, because we just. I think the feeling is. You just outsource to cut costs, and then you get you get a Filipino uh, that costs two hundred bucks a month, and you don't care much about who's behind it. Like you go to an outsourcing company and just get a number. But mm -hmm. what I've noticed is, in many cases, people certainly start with that maybe approach of I want to cut costs, but then realize along the way or while working that wow, okay, the, the people just like me and start developing a very positive relationship and emotions come into play and some build friendships or like we have even like a guy from a client who came here on a project, ended up married with, with one of our employees and now they have a baby. So it's you see this as a business transaction, but as it goes, you create these bonds with people that are most of the time absolutely fantastic. So I think that's what people don't think about because we come with a business mindset and the money mm -hmm. saving stuff. Looking forward, how would you say that you would be able to innovate in order to stay ahead of the curve? Um, I think the way we are investing now is a lot of people try to do that, but I think at the scale we're doing from what we've seen around us mm -hmm. is a lot bigger than others and the way we do this is also a bit more sophisticated and for us we really see this as this virtuous circle uh, cycle that i mentioned earlier where um, it will be generating really positive returns for everyone and so that's what we're really pushing at the moment is it's just so positive we're, we've built something now we can do that we can help other people which will help us in return or help the business in returns. That's what we're going to push in the next uh, couple of years. We've made that shift late last year, and we're full steam ahead with that. Okay, brilliant. Uh, and Fred, if you were listening to this episode, what would you say would be your top takeaway? I don't know. I think it's always to look at the bright side and try to think, okay, how can we find solutions that everybody wins? So in, in increasing the pie. I have a bit of a sweet tooth. So like the, how can we make it bigger for everyone? So everyone gets a bit more of it. So that's like maybe what I would want to take from that. Sure. Brilliant. And if listeners are curious, want to find out more or connect with you, where would you recommend they head to? LinkedIn, I think is the easiest. So, so my name is okay. Frederick Joy. And if you type in Frederick Joy and Arcanis, you'd probably find me pretty easily. Okay. We'll include links to that in the show notes. Fred, thank you so much for doing this. It's been brilliant. Thank you, Vinay. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you.